Welcome everyone to our panel discussion today, Sector Spotlight on the Green Economy, which is part of our ongoing Sector Spotlight series. Today we're looking at what's going on in the green economy, which will include looking at the areas of growth in the sector, how to prepare for a career, and we'll hear from some grads currently working in the green economy. Our panelists are going to share with you insights into the work they do and how to best prepare yourself for success, as well as define what is meant by the green economy and what's happening in the sector employment wise. So it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists we have on board for today's discussion. Sarah Casorso is Director of Employer Services at Eco Canada, which is an online resource for environmental jobs, certification and training. In her role, Sarah oversees the corporate human resource function and employer services at Eco Canada, leading the employer services and strategy, design and execution of project plans, communication and operational requirements. She also builds and maintains relationships with external partners, including post-secondary institutions and career advancement service providers to ensure an adequate supply of qualified professionals to meet the needs of Canada's growing environmental workforce. Sarah resides in Calgary, Alberta. Welcome, Sarah. Henry Guerrero is the regional HR manager for the Atlantic region for GFL Environment Inc., which offers diversified environmental services across North America. In his role with GFL, Henry implements human resource programs by providing human resources services, including talent acquisition, staffing, employment processing, compensation, health and safety, and many other functions. Henry graduated from our human resource management program in 2015. He sat on the program advisory committee for the School of Human Resources to advise on the development of academic programming. He also has and continues to volunteer for many community organizations. Henry is coming to us from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Welcome, Henry. Hello, Trisha and panel, and uh, thank you for having me to here today. Great, great. It's good, good to have you here. Himani Patel is the Building Structural Division Administrator with MTE Consultants, which is a multidisciplinary engineering firm providing services in civil and structural engineering, building and environmental science, toxicology and land surveying. In her role, Himani works on a variety of sized structural engineering projects, preparing design and construction administration documents. Himani graduated in 2020 from our Construction Engineering Technician Civil Engineering Program. While at the college, she was a teaching assistant and a senior peer leader. Welcome, Himani. Thank you, Trisha. Miyoko Oikawa, is a manager of research and innovation at Doug Terry Homes, a home building company that was the recipient of the Enter Quality 2020 Ontario Green Builder of the Year Award. In her role, Miyoko develops and promotes research and innovation initiatives across the organization, and her aim is to guide the construction industry towards a more sustainable and resilient future. She is the chair of the Local Energy Efficiency Partnership, part of Enercans, known as LEAP Advisory Committee, and the Ontario representative for Canada Home Builders Association's Technical Research Council. She graduated in 2015 from our Bachelor of Technology Construction Management and Building Science program. She's a recipient of various awards, one being the 2015 Student Innovation Award. Welcome, Yoko. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's get started. And I'm just gonna start with Sarah. Now, Sarah, I use the term green economy, but not everyone understands what that means. What's the proper definition of the sector? What kind of employers are included in this sector? Sure. So um, at Eco Canada, I mean, we also refer to it as the environmental sector or the clean um, economy, green economy. But basically, the sector of the economy is that one that produces um, advances or invests in environmental goods and services to achieve sustainable goals. Uh, so the sector really encapsulates um, every aspect of the supply chain involving traditional and emerging industries. So as an example, um, a construction company that's specializing in net zero buildings or an educational institution that's providing training for these workers that would contribute to a clean or green economy. And so our definition at ECO really includes employers across all industries. And what makes them environmental workers is that their activities um, contribute to environmental protection, natural resource management, 
um, as well as sustainability. Okay, that's great to get that, that that further look at it. And I know that, I mean, Eco Canada, I think it's been around for quite some time. I discovered it literally just a couple of years ago and thought, this is amazing. It's such a great resource. And I know later on, I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, but I wanted to turn my question to Henry now. Henry, can you tell us a bit about where you're seeing growth in GFL? Which GFL, I guess, would be part of, from that different definition, it's definitely in the green economy and would be defined through Eco Canada as a really important company that's doing great things for sustainability. Can you tell us about the growth with GFL and the sort of jobs uh, that you need to fill? Yeah, absolutely. So with GFL, you know, a simple answer to that is we are hiring everywhere all over North America. You know, we're the fourth largest in North America, soon to be number three. Uh, and with that, there is a huge demand and growth with our business. You know, we are essentially a mergers and acquisitions business. And here specifically in Atlantic Canada, during the pandemic, we actually attained seven new businesses. And if we look at our employee growth, for example, back about five years ago, we were about 15,000 employees. Today, we're at just over 19,000. So we are growing at such a rate. I would say that we are definitely pandemic proof. Um, garbage is an essential service, um, as you all know. And with that, we're constantly hiring and looking for new talent to come within the organization. In terms of what we're mainly focusing on right now, and I don't want to set this aside from any kind of corporate roles, like such as finance, payroll, HR, for example, as some of them. But the ones that are mainly affecting us right now in the industry today is since the pandemic, as you all know, we've been all hit in one way or another especially when it comes to recruitment. And right now, truck drivers is definitely on the rise for a role that's definitely needed for most businesses. If we look at current statistics, it is estimated that there are roughly about 28,000 empty seats across the, across the whole country. So looking at that, having that need for truck drivers already, for us, that's absolute uh, essential role that we want to fill, mm -hmm. especially when you know a bunch of our trucks service all of North America. With that as well, too, if our trucks break down, well, we also need mechanics. Uh, and with mechanics today, that has become quite a need. So in terms of the need right now, it would definitely be those two roles. However, as we're expanding our businesses, as you saw from 15 to 19, we definitely need more roles from a corporate setting. So for anyone interested in, in finance or HR or payroll or engineering or anything uh, that could be of an interest, we are definitely looking for that talent right now. Well, from what you're saying, we have a lot of programs that fit very nicely into what you're looking for. So we'll have to talk afterwards too around, you know, how do you how do you work more closely with us to bring on our grads right into GFL? Um, and we will talk for sure, Henry, after after our webinar. Maybe we'll all be in touch right away about that. Absolutely. That sounds yeah, that sounds great. And uh, my next question goes to Himani. Can you share with us what pivotal things happened to you that shaped your career choices and how you ended up in the work you do now? Since so many grads are really curious to, to hear how grads, when they come out of the college, are successful in finding work. For sure, uh, Trisha. I've uh... To start with, I've done Bachelor of Engineering in Civil from India, which was mostly focused on concrete design. Then I chose Construction Engineering Technician course as an international student to learn more about Canadian Ontario building codes, steel design and wood design. My grades were very good, with, uh, which lent me an opportunity to work as a senior peer leader, helping my peers to solve their questions and problems building their first residential demo. I also worked with Ms. Jesse as teaching assistant for basic mathematics for engineering, which helped me boost my communication skill, Excel and word doc uh, uh, skills. Being an uh, in international, I had only few points of contacts and uh, references. Uh, it helped me build that. And uh, it was wonderful on campus uh, opportunity, which lent me more and more opportunities. Uh, I will definitely recommend to all students who are studying and looking to make uh, extra income, friends, dev uh, develop skills, etc. Should reach out. Uh, students should reach out to this on-campus opportunities. I believe at this moment I'm working with uh, admin department and MTE consultants, uh, Toronto division. But I have the opportunity here to join technical department in future. That's great. So lots of opportunities are going to open up for you. Yes. 
that's wonderful. And I and I, I think that you're right with the students that are watching, if they have the opportunity to consider how do they build some of their skills right now on the college campus, getting involved in different areas of the college so that they can build on their communication skills, meet people, do that networking piece that's so essential as well. Thank you, Himani. Miyoko, when did your interest in working in construction sustainability first arise as a career direction and what happened to shape your career pathway? Yeah, um, I first actually became interested in the sector while at the college working under Dr. Timisk and the Argyle Research Project. Um, and that was really focused around building science, uh, specifically on exterior cladding retrofits. But building science itself is such a is so heavily tied into this idea of sustainability. Um, so I really got uh, a lot of experience participating in collaborative research at the college and got a lot of exposure to the type of work that that involved. Uh, and it was a really great way to learn how to approach problems that affect multiple stakeholders. Also had the opportunity to learn energy modeling um, while I was completing my degree at the college. So on top of my experience um, with building science, it really helped to strengthen my knowledge around high performance construction, which I think at the time was a real focus for the industry as they began to adapt um, to programs that had additional requirements outside of the building code. So lots of touch points that kind of got you on your way. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, good. It's good to hear that you know, the college has a lot of those supports available to you and helping you to get those, those take those steps to, to move you where you want to be. So that's great to hear. Um, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you because a lot has happened. I know that uh, I think Henry mentioned COVID and a lot has happened in the last few years to turn our attention to the green economy. So maybe COVID is one of those things, but also it, what we're experiencing with climate uh, and the, and, you know, so it's really important and the importance of companies focused on sustainable development, right? So it feels like there's been a massive explosion in the amount of companies hiring and the number of available jobs in the sector. Can you share what you've observed across the sector in employment terms and where you see growth in the sector? Yeah, so I mean, green jobs are are on the rise given the collective focus on better environmental standards and, and accountability. So there's significant opportunity and drive for enterprises and, and practitioners to shift their their business practices and skill set to, to um, participate in a net zero economy. Mm -hmm. So a, a career working to foster environmental um, best practices while supporting an organization's growth is already in, you know, commonplace and was starting before COVID and, and it's gonna continue across all industries. So I did pull some, um, just some of our latest research findings that the research team at Eco Canada has done that I thought might be relevant to this conversation. Sure. Um, and so we we found that while there were significant job losses in 2020 with you know the results of the COVID um, pandemic, the environmental employment in Canada grew by 11 percent um, from 2019 to 2020, and then one in 26 Canadians were in a green role in 2020, which equates to about the the size of Manitoba's um, employed labor force, mm -hmm. and most businesses or enterprises that, um, you know, are, they take up a, a significant portion of this would be the small and medium sized organizations. And then we were also showing that um, continued job growth and retirements is going to account for uh, 173,000 net environmental job openings by 2025. So that's equivalent to about 25% of 2020 employment levels. And so 43% of these jobs will stem from expansion demand, while about 57% will be replacement demand. And so we're seeing talent shortages um, across a wide range of occupations, including physical and life science professionals, inspectors in public um, and environmental health and occupational health and safety, urban and land use planners, construction managers, conservation and fishery officers, and then water and waste um, water treatment plant operators. And so we're, we're seeing that employers really need new multi-skilled talent to step up into these roles that are being left unfilled. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, marginalized groups, transitioning workers from declining industries and existing workers really need equitable access to the tools and resources to enter um, the workforce or progress their careers. Mm -hmm. 
And so we're also showing or, or seeing that training and upskilling needs to be more accessible to support these workers that are transitioning into the you know, critical growing or emerging jobs. And then green literacy and the sustainability mindset, um, knowledge of environmental policy, legislation, um, indigenous relations, project management, all those sort of soft skills, um, they're also gonna be needed and, and critical to pursuing clean growth in, in Canada. And so I know that you're you're partnering with a lot of educational institutions to help help move some of the the uh, graduates into roles like that. Do you do you come on campus and do, I guess, recruitment events or for employers? You bring what kind of recruitment are you involved in? Well, we do. I mean, we have a huge wage subsidy program uh, for co-op students, and so a lot of the promotion starts there. Um, with the different career fairs and, um, you know, employer presentations and student presentations. We do different networking events across the country. So there's a lot of sort of grassroots, I guess, um, events that we also participate in. But most of it is just trying to connect the employers uh, and the students together, which, um, you know, is something that we do through our wage subsidy programs, which is all on, on the website. Okay, I'm going to go take take a look at that for sure. Great to have that. And now with the new budget coming out, there's going to be a lot more money, I think, going towards uh, funding a lot of companies that have a, a, a focus on sustainability and are part of that green or environmental economy. So great news. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask Henry, how, how could you advise those new to the industry to navigate their careers? And just, you know, Sarah was saying, you know, there's those that are pivoting into a new um, career because of COVID. Maybe their industry isn't doing as well. Um, how do you advise those to navigate their, their career? And in, in, in many of the cases, is networking really essential? Is lifelong learning really important? How do they best prepare themselves for their career? Well, you know what, whether it's this industry or other industries, you know, the one advice I always give to anybody asking for, you know, where do I go with this? How do I figure out where I want to be in terms of role? Really is to try different things, to find out what you like, what you're really good at. I know in my young career uh, early on, you know, starting off as a coordinator, HR coordinator, I didn't really know where I wanted to do. Um, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to try different roles and see where the right fit is. So, you know, whether that was moving more into a generalist role, more into a recruiter role, more employer relations, it's best to really be well-rounded that way to find out, you know, which, which venue do I want to go down? Which one is a better fit for myself? And when it comes to networking, necessarily doesn't necessarily mean you're networking with somebody to find the next role. It's also asking them their own experiences. What worked for you? What didn't work for you? What didn't you like about your role? And you also get some insight into the organization in terms of their company values. You know, what is their direction? How are they moving forward? So you can really be informed in, before you make your next big move. Now, of course, through networking, you can definitely find that next opportunity, but make sure you really find out if this is the right role for you within that industry. So I would just say really dive, dive in, try it out, even if it's uncomfortable because it may be something new to you, but that's how you get your experience and that's how you develop your career professionally. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good advice, you know, sort of try, try some different roles on. And I know that one way to, to prepare for a career is also to understand some of the new trends coming up. So that can be discovered through conversations with people in certain industries. Uh, Miyoko, what are some of the new trends that have emerged over the last few years in the construct, construction industry in sustainable building? And also, if you could add, my, my questions are always double Double questions. Um, could you also add some of the trends that you're seeing in the workplace uh, for you and others on your team? Yeah, I think um, for the industry, there's been a real acknowledgement that we have to start looking at things from more than just an energy efficiency lens and to start considering things like embodied and operational carbon waste reduction and um, resiliency measures, which I think is kind of more difficult to define or we're sort of in the process of defining what that is. But over the last few years, we've really seen a rise um, in the creation of municipal green development standards. So again, more than just energy efficiency, but looking at additional measures. Um, and also, um, as, as was previously mentioned, I think by Sarah, um, this emergence of ESG, so environmental, social and governance, um, which is a strategic framework, but a way of looking at the way that a company is organized and the way that they do business. 
Um, and so that that is really big now. We're seeing a lot of a lot of roles within companies who didn't have that before. Um, and again, a, a different way of looking at the way that we conduct our business. Um, mm -hmm. And then within the work that I do, there's definitely a shift towards um, this line of thinking with the national building code. So I do a lot of work with building code development, both on the provincial side and the national side. And again, at national, they're even starting to explore code requirements for things like carbon resiliency and even alterations to existing buildings. So it's really interesting to see how some of these things that were kind of like forward thinking years ago mm -hmm. um, start to become standard practice. Mm -hmm. And if you're and if you're a grad and you want to keep up with certain trends, like is there a a source or a resource that you would suggest people you, that you would direct people to look at to see what some of those trends are that are coming up now and will continue to arise in the industry? Yeah, I think if you're coming from um, like a similar background to mine, uh, your association, your construction association, so like the Ontario Home Builders Association or the locals, they do a lot of events, the Canadian Home Builders Association as well. Um, there's a lot of knowledge sharing from those organizations, uh, people like ULI, um, Urban Land Institute holds a lot of events around sustainability within kind of the municipal or, or planning side. Um, so really it's, there's a lot of people holding free events, free webinars since COVID um, and paid events like conferences. And those are a really great way to get um, forward thinkers together and people who may be like-minded and really hear about what's going on. Yeah, I think there's more of those going on. It seems more conferences, um, you know, pulling people together and really brainstorming on new initiatives and, and what's happening in particular industries. So that's a great one. Um, Hey, Manny, you're you're probably the 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 newest grad here, I guess. You're relatively a new grad. What are some of the challenges that you had when starting your current job, and how did you cope? Did you search out a mentor at your company, and and also what most surprised you when you started your career? Well, I started. Uh, I graduated in April 2020, which was uh, starting era for COVID. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, industry was highly impacted with COVID and the lockdown was going on. And I'm sure it was a hard time for everyone, but especially for new grads, it was a uh, little bit more. <laughs> However, I tried my best to look for a job in construction industry. I believe my, uh, I believe company websites, Indeed and LinkedIn are more reliable source to apply for a job. Mm -hmm. um, I applied my job through MTE Consultants Inc. website and I got it. And no, I didn't look for a mentor, but uh, I researched a company and I reached out to people on LinkedIn. I um, asked them questions about how MT works and uh, their standard um, format about how re hiring new grads. So I was looking mm -hmm. for uh, that kind of opportunity in the beginning. And uh, when the surprise I got when I went for in-person interview, I found out that for a short, short period, I will be working with Atkins Vanguard Consultants, uh, the company which recently merged with MTE Consultants. And however, that is the best thing happened to me because uh, ABG is the small company, but I had different experience over there and uh, MTE is the like big company. And it's a corporate label, so I had my different experiences here. So I learned a lot. And as I, as you mentioned, I I am recently graduated, so I have. Mm -hmm. It's I believe that to have like different experiences in your beginning of career, uh, that dictates your career choices in future. So. Yeah, and you're just beginning. There's lots of opportunities that will open up to you. So it's very exciting. Um, yes. And, you know, again, it's finding resources, uh, reaching out to people, figuring things out at the beginning. Mentoring is a great way to go, I think, if, if you're looking to get some guidance on a career path, a look at a company that you start and see what they offer around that. Um, I know that Eco Canada has a lot of uh, resources on their particular website. And um, Sarah, can you talk a bit more about what people can find when they visit Eco Canada? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, Eco Canada, we, we stand for the Environmental Careers Organization of Canada, and we are up on our 30th year of uh, existence. And oh, wow. so we really are a, a leader in environmental thought, leadership, and workforce uh, solutions. So, 
lots of people know us for kind of one flagship product that maybe they interact with, but we do so, so much. So um, there's lifelong learning and training. So from entry level to mid uh, level learners, um, workforce people that are transitioning or newcomers to Canada, we have so many different topics and courses that that people can take um, that are, you know, develop related to different things like essential skills or employability, um, technical writing, project management, that kind of thing. Uh, we also have our Indigenous training. So for First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities, our flagship BEAR program uh, empowers Indigenous individuals with technical and essential skills that really harness the traditional knowledge alongside the environmental protection and sustainability practice. And then we also have our environmental program um, accreditation. So this is uh, a program that strengthens the link between academic programs and then core environmental jobs and skills that really creates that talent pipeline through um, assessing and accrediting, sorry, accrediting post-secondary environmental programs. Mm -hmm. uh, then we also have our EP designation. So that stands for an environmental professional. And so that's uh, a professional certification program for practitioners um, who are committed to the field and, and dedicated to continuous learning. So there's a mentorship um, program within it. So, you know, kind of talking um, on that last question there, but mm -hmm. there's mentorship, there's other resources for that really support that lifelong learning as well. And then it's, um, it's founded by industry driven national occupational standards. Um, so that's really you know, articulating what it what it means to work in the profession along with the required uh, competencies. And then the areas that I actually look uh, after at Eco Canada. So we have an HR solution. So that's fully customized uh, people management and recruiting services to help environmental employers and HR professionals sort of alleviate hiring obstacles or address retention gaps, um, talent management, that kind of thing. And then what most people I think know us for is our employment program. So that is um, partnerships with the federal government. We facilitate job creation through wage and training subsidy programs for young professionals um, and new entrants to, to the workforce. So we have a number of programs under the youth employment and skills strategy, um, but we're also a key delivery partner for our immigrant bridging program as well as a new program, um, our apprenticeship service, which is a partnership with ESDC and the Electricity Human Resource Council. So there's like, there's so much on our website. You really just have to kind of go and, and take a look around. And I have poked around, of course, and it's amazingly rich in information, which is, is wonderful. And I didn't realize it'd been around for 30 years, so a really long time. Uh, lots of layered information in there. So I advise anyone who's going on to it, take your time. I really spend uh, quality time on it. There's lots of information there of great interest. Um, Henry, can you share with us your career tra trajectory and what pivotal things happened to you that shaped your career direction? I know that you've also volunteered in the past you, and you continue to. How do some of those activities help you to gain insight or how did they help you to gain insight into the work you wanted to do? So for the first part about my career, so starting off young at the time, you know, as I mentioned before, really jumping in, trying different things, coming into my first HR job at Post Media, going to print publication, I always wanted to work in the newsroom with the editors. I found that so fascinating. So being there young and learning and seeing, you know, the editors work in action, it was a lot of fun. And through that, I started off as an HR administrator, moved to HR coordinator. But after being there for just under two years, I thought, you know, it's time to take a jump to something different. I wanted to be in retail. I wanted to be in fast fashion. So I joined H&M as the country employee relations for Canada. In that role, it was so interesting and it was so fast paced and so different from what I was used to. Um, and from there, again, jumping into different experiences. So I became country employee relations from there, moving into more a regional HR role because I really wanted to understand more sales, KPIs, what the stores would do. And I was learning so much, but similar to Himani's story, you know, graduating during the pandemic starting for me during that time, the pandemic hit and uh, I had family in the East Coast and I thought, you know what, I don't know where things are going to go. I decided to move my whole life to the East Coast and my company was so great at the time to, to com accommodate me being there. 
But when things had actually opened up again, they said, you know what, we need a regional HR back in Ontario because you can't have an HR not present in the region. Uh, I made the difficult decision to leave, but it was on good terms. However, now I was left in a situation with no job at the time. And I would say that I fell into um, an environmental organization. I had uh, someone re recruit me out and say, hey, we have a, an amazing position available. It's to cover maternity. Why would you want to try maybe? Are you interested? And I said, why not? You know, uh, I, I jumped into the role. Uh, it was a one year uh, agreement. Next, you know, they extended out four more months. Next, you know, I got full time permanent. And this is where I'm at today. I never thought that I would be in a waste management company going from retail to waste management, but it's perhaps the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's interesting. Sometimes you go into it thinking this is exactly what I want to do. But then next, you know, it's not where you end up. You know, so sometimes you just got to follow where life leads you. But to answer your next question here um, in terms of, you know, community involvement, you know, for me, uh, volunteering is super important dear to my heart. I think it's super important to have local relevancy within your communities to understand who your communities are and to give back. But on the other side of things, you know, the HR piece, there are some transferable skills you can definitely get from volunteering as just as much, you know, to have the people part is for some people a little bit tricky to connect with people and for others, it's quite simple. And with me volunteering, whether it's at a soup kitchen, for example, talking to different personalities, different walks of life, different experiences, I was able to learn so much about people and able to connect with them. And I truly believe that's helped me be successful in my role because I'm able to connect with people even more. Um, and I think it brings you back uh, to basics and makes you humble as well too. And that's super important. So for me, I think for anybody looking into volunteering, definitely do it. It opens opportunities, great networking as well too, and it will teach you those transferable skills that you may not have at that time, but will definitely develop over time as well. Those are really good points. And I think that, you know, sometimes when graduates come out of college, they just, they're waiting to get that perfect job. And so they're waiting for that offer. And in the meantime, yeah, get out there, volunteer, do things that get you out in front of people, keep you involved, keep you enthusiastic about what you want to do, and then try on different things. And I know that, you know, sometimes grads say, well, I didn't take that job because they were just offering it for maybe a contract or right. a few months. But often those things can turn into really great long-term full-time jobs, you know. Absolutely. So, yeah, really good points to make. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, I wanted to ask um, Himani about your college experience. Experiences did they prepare you for success in your career? With the I know you touched on it a little bit earlier around um, being a peer leader, teaching. How did that help you in in making decisions around your career? Uh, as I mentioned, Trisha, we uh, previously uh, had privilege after working with SLC um, as a senior uh, peer leader and. Uh, Mrs. Jesse, that my, my profile was a little bit different than my fellow colleagues who just graduated mm -hmm. and hiring process and going through hiring process for on campus job kind of gave me general um, perspective of how hiring process uh, goes uh, in general for like, uh, because I was international, so I didn't had a uh, Canadian experience before. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was kind of like exposure to the industry. And then I'm a person who likes to know more about company and the various number of experiences I can get. So while working over um, there, uh, intrigues me more that I can, uh, what kind of experience I do I get? Like, uh, do I get to work on so many things at the same time? As Henry said before, that the experience led choices, uh, how you want to do it. Uh, like, in the beginning, I wanted to uh, get P engine to do uh, designing uh, for the structure or the general civil engineering. But then I realized uh, because of COVID, it was highly impacted and I was new. So it will, and it definitely will take me a longer time to get there. But I decided to go on administrative style uh, side. So uh, I know that how the documentation work, how the projects uh, work from the start to end. And I, in future, maybe I'll do masters and join my journey, what I wanted, but at this moment, I'm um, doing this new admin role. So I hope it led me there. Okay, well, thanks, thanks, Betty. How about you, Miyoko? How did, how did you go about your job search once you graduated? What was the most important thing you did to prepare yourself for getting into your career? 
Um, so the nice thing about the program that I went through is that it actually has um, co-op terms. So I actually was able to set up my work situation before graduating, which uh, which many of my cohort were able to do as well. So I was working with the Argyle Research Project, um, and I also had a part-time job uh, with Sustainable Buildings Canada, who does a lot of work with Enbridge um, through their uh, Savings by Design program or their Demand Side Management programs. So as I said, I also learned to do energy modeling um, and started my own company doing that work while still in school, and I still do that work now. Um, but I think the most important thing that I did for my career development was um, like much like I think other people on this panel have already said was to just say yes to everything. I attended like a bunch of conferences, networking opportunities. I also um, was proactive in, in saying, you know, I want to learn this work. How do I go about doing that? Asking for di different opportunities. Um, and that really helped me to both expand my network um, and learn additional uh, skills, which has really helped me in my career. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. Like, seek out opportunities. Don't uh, often. I think people in general, you wait until something's offered to you. But mm -hmm. I think it's a really good uh, a piece of advice to get out there and see where do you feel you want to grow. What do you want to know next? Be curious, and that will also take you uh, along different channels of your career. And you you might be surprised by some of the things you find. You know, that's great. Thank you, um, Sarah. I wanted to ask you. What is your advice to those interested in working in the in the green sector? How do you get started? Uh, and that means in, in geographical location terms, maybe is there certain places where there's there are more jobs opening up than others? What should those grads who are thinking about this consider? What are some of the skills that are in high demand and any of these upcoming trends that they should be aware of? I think a good place to start would be our our website, the Eco Canada website. For just the, we have a job board. You can take out, you know, take some time to see what actual opportunities exist right now, um, or our wage funding. But I think in terms of geographical locations, traditionally we see, you know, BC, Alberta, Ontario as kind of like the leaders in terms of where the jobs are, and that's due to population and all sorts of things. Um, but there's a ton of opportunities across. The coasts, um, the Atlantic provinces, there's a ton of uh, blue ocean uh, opportunities that are coming up with different types of energy and, and all sorts of things. Um, the north, the northern provinces and um, territories are having a hard time getting people up there. There's obviously some economic considerations, but there are lots of opportunities. In terms of the, the skills that are in demand, I think. I kind of alluded to some of those earlier with, you know, green literacy and sustainability, um, like the mindset and knowledge of environmental policy and, and legislation. But there's also uh, more specialized skills, uh, you know, data interpretation and and being able to um, make reliable predictions and recommendations, that kind of thing. So we've seen the role of a data analysis, as an example, is is in demand um, in terms of like the clean tech industry growth. So that's something that's going to be really important for the scalability of, of new technologies that are coming out um, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, other other trends that we're seeing are in the, the green building, um, energy efficiency, impact assessments, um, cleanup of contaminated contaminated areas. Uh, there's there's a ton of opportunities across the country, and and we are seeing more um, opportunities in like the management or the natural and applied sciences, and then business finance administration, like what some of the other panelists are talking about today. Um, so so there's a lot of opportunities, and and it's about that yeah networking and knowing um, the resources to to, to check out. Mm -hmm. And finding out what what companies are out there, and I think I'm about your site. I think you have a directory of companies as well that are in that in the environmental sector. Is that right? Was there a directory of companies? So if someone was researching, they could go there and find out what are the key companies that are are doing business in Canada. We have like a few different sort of variations of. There was a directory, um, but now you know, looking on the job board to see who's posting. Um, but then also we have uh, an EP employer, and so that's where you can go and see um, some of those those companies that you're speaking about okay. are doing those things. Okay, great, thanks, Sarah. Um, Henry, what's really great right now about being in the industry, and what final piece of advice do you have for those considering looking for opportunities? 
Well, there's such a big focus and there'll continue to be a big focus on environmental causes, ensuring that companies are being smart with how they're actually producing material, content, all that stuff. Um, and especially for GFL, like if we think about our goal, our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2045. And we have a lot of work to do. This is a time where technology also, as we know, is expanding at such a rate. So to see where we're actually going to evolve and go with to actually support our cause be carbon neutral is fantastic. So anyone coming in that's interested in joining an organization, environmental or sustainability, this is the time to come in. You know, there's a lot of opportunities, as I told you, and to go off what Sarah had mentioned, there is a lot of opportunities, even in Atlantic, as she had mentioned. So if we think of the growth that we've had over the past five years, this is the time to join. There's a lot of benefits to be part of a great cause, a lot of great learnings as well, too, and a lot of uh, professional development within wherever you want to go. With GFL, again, we're all over North America, so whether you want to potentially start with us here in Atlantic, eventually move out to Alberta or move down to the States, anything is possible. But I think this is a fantastic industry to be a part of and a great cause as well, too. Well, thanks for that, Henry. And it's so encouraging to hear that. And 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 just on the tales of what Sarah's saying around, you know, it just sounds like there's there's work everywhere across Canada. And it's really blossoming in different areas as well. So lots of our grads could probably find a, a place for themselves uh in in different within different opportunities, uh different companies and all across Canada. And I, I think I'll just put it out to everyone then, you know, what is what is your final advice to those who are looking to to start their careers within the green sector? Is there any final piece of advice? Anything you want to leave grads with before we wrap up? I can go. That's okay. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I I would just say that you know obviously we're all saying that there is roles available, and I think really doing your research in terms of what role you want to be involved in, especially when it comes to environmental. In terms of, do you want to be in, for example? liquid waste, solid waste, you want to go into more electric water, what is what is more important to you? And, you know, thinking about what cause is important to you and then go from there and see what roles they have available. Try it out. And if it doesn't work, then look at other opportunities. But if it does work, um, you know, in my own experience, as I said to you before, being in an industry I never thought I would ever be in, I absolutely love it. But it mm -hmm. took a, quite a change, like a pandemic to move me towards that. But had a pandemic never happened, I may never have discovered it. So I would say just really don't be, you know, don't be fearful. Try it out, dive in. Um, but I do believe that there is a lot of great opportunities in any kind of environmental sustainable business to, to be a part of at this time. Fantastic. Thanks, Henry. Anyone else want to add to that? I would just add to what Henry's saying with um the transferable skills, right? Skills that you're getting in any job that you have are um, needed in, in the green economy. And so I think just making sure that you're able to articulate that to the people that you're networking with or that you're applying for jobs, because um, those are your experiences are, are really important and valid and, and should be showcased. So um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. good points, definitely. Miyoko, you many any last uh, things to, to advise our grads on? Yeah, I would just say say yes, participate in all of the opportunities for knowledge sharing and continuous learning, attend all the sessions, join the councils, network. This really does allow you to develop a broader perspective while also opening up opportunities for yourself to be able to present the things that you're working on um, and you know, create future connections to be able to collaborate on on things that align with your values. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, definitely true. Absolutely. Uh, hey, Manny, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, I mean, like in today's era, there are like so many options and platforms available for job hunting. Whichever platform uh, like you use, but make sure like uh, you use company website, search for it. Uh, doesn't matter if the company is small or but look for the experience you can get from that company. Um, that was, I think, my thing when I uh, started looking for the job. And yes, I'm experimenting. 
Yeah, and it never stops, right? You just have your career yes. grows. <laughs> None of us can say now that we're, we're we're in our careers and it all kind of that's it. You're always looking for the next opportunity. You're always ensuring that you have joy in the work you do. So you know, be curious, see what you're what's going on out there that looks kind of fun and that you would like to give a try and go for things like that. I think that's really important. Yeah, sometimes you end up having changed the entire career at all. Sometimes you like what you do, but you won't know until you do it, right? That's right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, Henry, Himani, Miyoko. Thank you for joining me today and sharing your stories, your insights, your career advice to our grads who are considering the green economy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Disha, for having us.